So thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I will say the first time I was in Houston was the summer after my freshman year in college. I was visiting my friend Todd Siff, who's actually an orthopedic hand surgeon here. And I wasn't here but 12 hours where I ended up at St. Luke's getting my appendix out. So I'm hoping for this trip I stay on the doctor's side. <laughs> so I'm going to be speaking about anticoagulation strategies for PE, trends, updates, and the role of direct oral anticoagulants, or DOACs. Oh, uh, here we go. Oops. Here we go. I don't have any disclosures. So I hope by the end of the talk that you become familiar with the DOACs, and then I'm going to spend the very end talking about some recent advances in VTE, cancer and clotting, and VTE awareness. So first, you've already heard about the scope of the problem, but just to let you know that, yes, it is the third leading cause of cardiovascular death, and it's estimated to be $1.5 billion a year. And this problem is not going away. Our people are getting older, cancer is on the rise, obesity continues to be a problem, and you can see that here. Another interesting fact about PE and DVT is that no one is immune from the oldest from the youngest to the oldest, from the most out of shape to arguably probably one of the most fit athletes in the world, Serena Williams got a PE after being on an airplane. So what are the treatment options? I actually recently wrote a review on the novel anticoagulants and wanted to look at where the first documented DVT was. And it was in the Middle Ages. There was a gentleman by the name of Raoul who was 20. He had pain and swelling in his calf and he went to seek some, some advice, and he was advised to go to the tomb of St. Louis in the church of St. Denis, and while there, rub some dust into his ulcers, which healed it. So I think we've come a, far, a long way from there. <laughs> and I put this up to say that we've actually come even farther from the 1960s. So we used to hospitalize patients for up to three weeks to treat them with unfractionated heparin. And it wasn't until the late 90s that we used outpatient low molecular weight heparin to treat people. And fortunately, in the last decade, we now have these DOACs. So here are the four that have been FDA approved for the treatment of DVT or PE, Xeralto or Rivaroxaban, Pradaxa or Dibigatran, Eliquis or Apixaban, Cevesa or Adoxaban. So I guess this I get a, this question a lot. Are these the new standard of care? Are these first-line therapy for people with DVT and PE now? Well, what makes a new standard of care? It has to be effective. It has to be safe. It has to be simple and reliable. It has to be adaptable and scalable. And patients have to be satisfied with it. So do the new agents meet these criteria? Well, the first one is, are they effective? So each of those four agents were tested against warfarin in non-inferiority trials. And the primary outcome was recurrent VTE or VTE-related death. And you can see here from these Kaplan-Meier curves that they all met their primary outcome and that they were exactly the same. Does this have a pointer? Yeah, here we go. So all of them met that outcome. So they were all uh, non-inferior. What about are they safe? So again, each of them were compared to warfarin, and the primary safety outcome was major bleeding, clinically relevant non-major bleeding, or intracranial hemorrhage. And you can see here, in these Kaplan-Meier curves, that the new agents actually did much better than warfarin in many of those bleeding situations. So yes, they're safe. What about are they simple and reliable? Well, they can be given in fixed doses. They do not require routine monitoring. They have fewer drug and food interactions, and they're much more predictable than warfarin. What about our patients satisfied? This was a study of patients with non-valvular AFib who were about to undergo cardioversion, and they were given a patient satisfaction score, and rivaroxaban scored significantly higher in patient satisfaction. So I think the answer is yes to those questions I asked. These drugs are effective, they're safe, they're simple and reliable, and patients are satisfied with them. And all of them have been approved for the treatment of DVT and PE, and none of them require monitoring. So should we just put everybody on these? There are some questions you need to ask before you think about putting people on these agents. The first one is, are they a candidate for these drugs? Do they have any comorbidities that might preclude them from being on them? Are the patients going to be compliant? Remember, with warfarin, you have an INR to follow. These patients, you're not going to have an INR to follow. And what about the cost? So I thought I would use a few cases to illustrate each of the drugs. 
This was a 70-year-old gentleman that developed a PE while vacationing. He was initially placed on Lomico at Heparin as a bridge to Coumadin, but his INRs were very difficult to control all over the place, even though he was very compliant with the drug and his diet. So his primary care doctor changed him to dibigatran. So what is dibigatran? It is a direct thrombin inhibitor. It has a rapid onset, about two hours. Half-life is about 12 to 17, and it's renally cleared. And the dose is 150 milligrams twice a day. So not to give you a little PTSD from medical school, but direct thrombin inhibitor is the very last step in the coagulation cascade. So dibigatran does have a limitation in that it's only been approved after you have a parenteral anticoagulant for the first five to 10 days. So you cannot just start somebody with a DVT and PE on dibigatran alone. You have to use lomicoid heparin, unfractionated heparin, erixtra, something lead-in. It's also unclear how to use these drugs in either very low weights or people who are morbidly obese. And remember, I said there's very few drug interactions, but there are a few, especially in patients that are on peak like a protein uh, agents. And if so, your, your patient is on those, you're not going to have a way to monitor them. Remember the INR with the warfarin, you were able to tell whether or not there was drug interaction. With these, you, you aren't. So I would stay away from those kind of drugs. So our patient was babysitting his sick grandkid. Unfortunately, he developed di diarrhea shortly after, which is what the grandkid had. As a result, he became quite lightheaded. He fell and hit his head, and his wife brought him to the emergency room, and his CAT scan showed this very small subdural bleed. Importantly, he tells you his last dose was 24 hours ago. So how do you deal with someone that's bleeding on dibigatran? Well, the first thing is you're going to stop the drug. And the half-life, I told you, is 12 to 17 hours, and that depends on your kidney function. If you have normal kidney function, you can expect the effect to be gone in about 72 to 96 hours. I will often check a STAT PTT, and if that is normal, it suggests that the dibigatran effect is gone. And obviously, you'll treat supportively with red cells if they need. So fortunately, we actually have an antidote for dibigatran called Prexpine, or idarocizumab. And it's been shown to be safe and effective in clinical trials, and it's currently FDA approved for patients that are on dibigatran that need rapid reversal or are bleeding. So our patient actually did well. They just followed him with serial scans, just held the drug, and he was able to start it a week later without any problems. So the second case is a 26-year-old woman. She developed right-sided pleuritic chest pain, and she actually thought it was a pulled muscle. But then she woke up kind of suddenly short of breath, <coughs> Her mother was a nurse, so urged her to go to urgent care. She had a chest x-ray, which looked like maybe she had pneumonia in the right lower lobe, so she was given antibiotics and sent home. Two days later, she still felt kind of crappy. She went to see her PCP, and she was complaining of a sore throat, so her primary care doctor said, oh, you must have strep, and gave her some other antibiotics for strep. But the following day, the pleuritic chest pain got so worse uh, she actually just decided to go to the ER. She had an elevated D-dimer, her CTA showed bilateral PEs, and she was placed initially on loma liquid heparin, but sent home on rivaroxaban. She went back to see her PCP, who really wasn't that familiar with it, so the PCP changed her back to loma liquid heparin as a bridge to Coumadin. But on the Coumadin, her INRs were very difficult to control. One day she'd eat a salad, the next day she wouldn't, and so it was very hard for her to control uh, her INRs. So she came to me for a second opinion. So things to consider in a 26-year-old woman is, number one, are they pregnant? So anyone with a blood clot who is um, childbearing age, you should obviously check a um, pregnancy test. She was not pregnant. Number two, cancer. So the new agents, I'll talk a little, about, a little bit about this later, but low microwet heparin is still the agent of choice for cancer at this time. You always want to ask about bleeding and make sure that they don't have someone under bleeding diathesis. You want to make sure these patients are going to be compliant. Remember, you can't check an INR. They have to have normal kidney and liver function. And then lupus anticoagulant, the new drugs have not been extensively evaluated in patients with lupus anticoagulant. So for her, she didn't have any of those, so I changed her to rivaroxaban. Rivaroxaban, unlike dibigatran, is a direct factor 10A inhibitor, has a fast onset, a half-life of about 11 to 13 hours, it is also uh, excreted renally. 
And unlike dabigatran, it doesn't need a lead-in, but what it does need is the first three weeks is a higher dose. So it's 15 milligrams twice a day for the first three weeks, and the thought is the risk of recurrent VTE is highest during that time. After three weeks, you can switch to 20 milligrams once a day. And again, this is where uh, the factor 10 inhibitors are in the coagulation cascade. There's a few issues with raroxaban. It's not recommended for creatinine clearance less than 30, and it's contraindicated if somebody has significant hepatic impairment and you need to take it with food. And like the bigotran, it does have a few interactions, so if your patients are on drugs that use those pathways, they shouldn't be on these drugs. So also, when these patients are on these drugs, you need to follow them fairly closely. Rich, you'll remember this patient. He is a 45-year-old male, DVT, PE, had an IVC filter, very symptomatic from his pulmonary hypertension, and Rich actually convinced him to come up to Mass General to get an elective pulmonary thromboembolectomy. He was initially placed on an unfractionated uh, bridge to Coumadin afterwards. He actually did quite well in the surgery. But unfortunately, he developed this rare occurrence of warfarin-induced skin necrosis. So we couldn't give him shots because his belly was all covered with the necrosis. So we restarted him on an unfractionated heparin drip. He was transitioned to rivaroxaban. Now, this is when rivaroxaban first came out. And over the next few days, he actually, for other reasons, developed acute renal failure, and no one kind of took that into account, and he ended up getting a pericardial effusion, and then when it's tamponaded, it needed a window. So it's very important that when you're putting patients on these drugs that you do follow them closely. So what do you do when somebody's hemorrhaging on rivaroxaban? You want to stop the drug. This is actually 90% protein bound, so it cannot be dialyzed. If the patient's taken the drug within a, a few hours, you can do charcoal hemofiltration. And there has been some reports in life-threatening ble bleeds with PCC, which is a prothrombin complex concentrates, which are factor levels. And fortunately, there is an antidote that is underway. It's called Agnexanet, and it's already been studied in healthy volunteers. This was a New England Journal article last year. And right now, we have it in a phase three trial looking at people who are on rivaroxaban, either need urgent surgery or are bleeding. And we have that trial open at Mass General, and I'm sure there's several places around the country that have it. I suspect that we'll know the answer to this in, within a year. So this is a case that was actually a PERT case. This is a 48-year-old gentleman with a history of, he had idiopathic Guillain-Barre about three years earlier, not treated, kind of resolved on his own, except for some residual numbness. And he presented to an outside hospital with acute shortness of breath. And you can see here his CT showed bilateral PEs, and he did have a, an RV-LV ratio greater than one. He was given a dose of Lovenox and sent to Mass General. At Mass General, he's pretty hypoxic, 87%, initially requiring 15 liters. Uh, his blood pressure was okay, but he was tachycardic and tachypnic, and he really couldn't speak more than a word or two without getting very short of breath. So given his hypoxia, tachypnea, hypokinesis, we decided to do catheter-directed. And he did great, and he felt fantastic, and he was actually discharged home on a Pixaban. So a Pixaban, similar to rivaroxaban, is a direct factor 10A inhibitor, has a rapid onset and a half-life of about 8 to 15 hours, it's excreted renally in the feces. And similar to rivaroxaban, you need to start with a higher dose for the first seven days. So it's actually 10 milligrams twice a day for seven days, followed by five milligrams twice a day. In the hospital, the patient's hematocrit was 26.8, which is low for a male. It should really be in the 40s. So he came to our follow-up clinic a month later, and he said to me, I feel great. I have not felt this great in months. I'm doing great with the apixaban. I'm doing all this stuff. And I said, well, let's check your hematocrit. Might have been due to the fact that you had this big PE and went underwent catheter-directed lysis, but it was still 26. So I did work him up, and it turns out that he had an M-spike. We did a bone marrow biopsy, and he had multiple myeloma. He's actually getting a bone marrow transplant this week. Uh, so it's very important to follow these patients up, especially ones with idiopathic uh, DVT or PE. So based on this case, actually, I think it raises an important question. Do all patients with an idiopathic blood clot need to be screened extensively for occult malignancy? So just by a show of hands, who would say yes? One person. Who would say no? Four people. Who would say I don't know? <laughs> the majority of you. Okay. 
So there's been a few studies on it. This was the most recent one. It was a multi-center open label randomized controls trial in Canada, almost 900 patients, and they were randomized to limited screening, and that was basic labs and age-specific cancer-related screening. So mammogram, colonoscopy, prostate exam, pap smear or they were randomized to that limited, plus they added an ABCT. And this was based on a study that this same author did a few years before that, looking at a review of all the cases of extensive versus limited screening. And he found that about 50% of the time, you'll discover a cancer just with limited testing. But he also discovered if an ABCT was added, it increased it to about 67%. So that was the impetus for this trial. And the uh, outcome was any cancer missed, either on the screener or within the first year of follow-up. And you can see here that both patients in the limited and the limited plus ABCT had the same number of cancers identified at the beginning and the exact same number identified at the one-year mark. So based on this, available data do not support an extensive search for occult malignancy in patients with idiopathic BTE. However, it's really important to do a, a really good history, physical exam, labs, like the patient I just showed you who was anemic, and also make sure people are up to date with age-specific cancer-related screening. I can't tell you how many people have come to our follow-up clinic where they have not had their mammogram, they've not had their colonoscopy, and we've even uh, diagnosed prostate cancer in those patients. So important to have a follow-up, some kind of follow-up. So this was uh, just another example of follow-up. This was a woman that I recently met, actually just last week. She was uh, 54, she had idiopathic PE, she came in short of breath, was uh, initially placed on lobic or heparin, but then not a bridge, it shouldn't say bridge, uh, uh, sorry, and a bridge to a doxaban. And she came to see me and she said, you know, I feel great, I haven't lost any weight, you know, no signs or symptoms suggestive of a cancer, um, but I did a physical exam on her and she had a 12 centimeter mass hard mass in her right quadrant, like right upper and mid-quadrant. And I said to her, have you felt this? And she felt it, and she said, no. <laughs> now, this woman had been seen in the hospital by all the doctors in the hospital, had actually seen her primary care doctor just a few days before me. And I said, well, we need to get an ABCT. Here's her ABCT. And I'm hoping this is just a fibroid, but there's a chance it could be a leiomyosarcoma. So importance of a physical exam as well as taking a good history and getting labs. So this patient was put on a doxaban, similar to rivaroxaban and apixaban. It is an oral direct tannin inhibitor. It has a rapid onset, about one to two hours, and the half-life is about 10 to 14. It's also excreted renally. And for treatment of DVT and PE, it's similar to dabigatran in that you need a lead-in. So you need to have some kind of heparin or lemicrit heparinorextra, and the dose is 60 milligrams once a day, or in patients that have less than 60 kilograms of weight or their creatinine clearance is 15 to 50, it's 30 milligrams. Uh, similar, like I said to the Dibigatran, you need this lead-in. But interestingly, because you needed this lead-in, if you look at this trial, approximately one-third of them had pretty severe right ventricular dysfunction. So I think the fact that the physicians felt comfortable, oh, I could put the person on lumbic right heparin for the first seven days, allowed them to enroll these more severe PEs. And they found in that subgroup of the patients that were given adoxaban versus warfarin that had that RV dysfunction, they had less recurrent DVTs and PEs. So I don't expect you to remember all of these. If, this is, if these are drugs that you are not used to giving, you should always look in the package insert because they're confusing. I've just told you that they all have different doses for different amount of times. But just in general, there's two that need bridging, dibigatran and adoxaban. There's two that don't need bridging, which is rivaroxaban and apixaban. And interestingly, the two that don't need bridging do have a higher dose initially. Rivaroxaban and adoxaban are once a day, apixaban and dibigatran are twice a day. And rivaroxaban you need to take with food. So a few other cautions about these DOACs. Um, there's only, at this point, one approved reversal agent, and that's for dibigatran, although I did tell you the other ones there's underway. Like I said, there's no monitoring for effect, so you can't really assess for compliance and adherence as well. Patients cannot have renal or hepatic failure. Reimbursement issues is, is an issue, especially with patients have, who have Medicare Part D, because warfarin's pretty cheap, and these are a little bit more expensive. Fortunately, we have amazing prior authorization nurses. I'm usually able to get what I need. 
Um, there are some post-marketing bleeding rates. Um, with dabigatran, there were over 250 bleeding deaths, mostly in patients that were over 80 and in renal failure. So you need to be uh, cautious in that population. Um, clinician familiarity, although I think that's getting better because these drugs have been around longer and people are getting to be, feel more comfortable. And there's not great guidelines about bleeding complications, but again, I think that's getting better too. The other few unanswered questions is we don't really know where these fit in with extensive DVT or massive PE, mostly because the patients were excluded in those trials because they thought they were going to have some kind of intervention. And we don't really know how these agents work with interventions. And there's not a lot of great data on patients with extreme weights. Actually, a few weeks ago, in a period of 10 days, I had three people caught on one of the new agents, two on rivaroxaban and one on apixaban. Now, they were all over 300 pounds. So I wouldn't recommend these in patients that are over 120 kilograms, because we don't really have great data about that. And then due to lack of antidote, these new agents may not be appropriate for people at high bleeding risk. So maybe someone that's going to be having surgery soon or just had a major trauma. But there are several advantages. They're oral. You do not need to monitor them. You do not need to titrate the dose. They have short onset, short half-life, predictable absorption and metabolism, few drug-drug interactions, and few dietary restrictions. So back to my first question, are these first line? Well, in fact, according to the CHESS guidelines, which a lot of people follow, uh, yes, they are considered first line. In somebody with DVT, they suggest these new agents over the vitamin K antagonists. There are no head-to-head -head trials of these agents, so they didn't say one, they preferred one over the other. So a few other questions I just want to briefly mention is, I get this a lot. How do you switch from one agent to another? What about your patient who's bleeding? And I probably get at least an email a day about how to deal with these agents perioperatively or procedural-wise. How long do you hold it for? So first, switching from one to another. This is a really good article that came out from the Anticoagulation Forum. It's in the Journal of Thrombosis Thrombolysis. Again, I would refer to the package insert on how to switch from one to the other. But in general, if you're switching from warfarin to one of the DOACs, usually you can start when the INR drops below 2.5. But I would um, advise you to look in the package insert. In terms of menstruation, this was an interesting article that came out from the Dresden Group, where they looked at women who were placed on the DOACs, and they found that the uh, vaginal bleeding event um, was about a third of the patients. And they discovered, actually, I tell my patients, look, you're going to start one of these agents your menses is going to increase, maybe 5%, 10%. Don't be alarmed by that. But if they found that women who had excessive bleeding, that many of them had anatomical abnormalities. So if you find your patient on one of these new agents excessively bleeding, you should look for some kind of anatomical abnormality. It's usually a fibroid. What about perioperative and, and procedural management? So there's five questions to ask when you're thinking about how long do I need to hold this drug? The first one is, what is the half-life of the drug? The second one is, what is the bleeding risk of the procedure? Is this someone that's going from neurosurgery or major orthopedic surgery, or is this something minor, like a knee arthroscopy? What is the bleeding and thrombotic risk of the patient? What is the current dose they're on? And what is their renal function? So this, again, is that same article in the Journal of Thrombosis Thrombolysis. And in general, I would say, if patients have a normal kidney function and it's a low bleeding risk surgery, you generally want to hold the drug for about two to three half-lives, which is about one or two days. If they have normal kidney function and they're going for high bleeding risk surgery, you really want to hold it for about half, five half-lives. That's about three to four days in some of these. If they have kidney problems and their creatinine is not working very well, I mean, their kidneys are not working very well, you're going to have to hold it for longer. So again, I always tell people to look in the package insert, and this is a really good guide. So other important topics, can you use these direct oral anticoagulants in cancer patients? Well, all the four studies that I told you, they all did include cancer patients, but only about 5 to 10%. So what's the association between cancer and thrombosis, first of all? Well, this dates back to 1865, when Armand Trousseau came, coined the phrase migrant thrombophlebitis as a forewarning of occult cancer. And this is one of my favorite quotes, that he said in 1865, should you, when in doubt as to the nature of an affection of the stomach, when hesitating between chronic gastritis, simple ulcer, and cancer, 
observe a vein become inflamed in the arm or the leg, you may dispel your doubt and pronounce in a positive manner that there is a cancer. Unfortunately, two years later, after suffering weeks of abdominal pain, he developed a thrombus and died of gastric cancer shortly thereafter. So cancer patients are a unique population with clotting. They are two to three times more likely to have recurrent clots, two to six times more likely to have hemorrhagic complications from their anticoagulation. They have decreased survival compared to cancer patients without blood clots. And the current recommendation is still low microwave heparin. And this comes from the CLOT study, which was published in the New England Journal. This was 336 lung cancer patients in each arm were randomized to war warfarin or daltaparin. And you can see here there was a 52% risk reduction in recurrent VTE. And in fact, in the patients that had curable disease, there was actually a mortality benefit in the patients that had the low microwave heparin. So based on this, this became the standard of care. This was updated and it was recently published with uh, almost uh, 800, 900 patients. Very similar, warfarin versus a different low microwave heparin. There was still an advantage, a, a, a risk reduction in DVT and PE, but you can see here it didn't meet statistical significance. Having said that, this is still considered the standard of care. Again, if you look at the CHEST guidelines, it still says in cancer-associated thrombosis, they suggest low microwave heparin over warfarin um, or one of the new agents. Fortunately, there are ongoing trials. We actually just closed one and opened another looking at this. I suspect that we will have this information probably within the year. I will also tell you there's some case series and case reports of some of these new agents in cancer patients that look very promising. So I always sit down with my patient when they want to switch to one of these. And usually we have a trial that I can put them on. But if not, you really have to tell them, right now I can't tell you that it's as safe and effective based on a randomized control study, but we do have this other data. So lastly, I'll just say that March is VTE Awareness Month, and I have to applaud the organizers of this to pick March, which they told me they did on purpose. <laughs> Um, so I think it's really important that you educate your patients and providers about DVT and PE. And I will just end with a case, and Rich will remember this is a PERT case. This was a woman who is um, an administrator, um, a very intelligent lady, who about four weeks before she presented, she started to notice shortness of breath with exertion. She used to go to boot camp and couldn't do it anymore. And she was giving a um, keynote address in Colorado. And so she called one of her friends who was a cardiologist and said, you know, I'm about to get on an airplane next week. I'm really worried because I'm getting short of breath. And her cardiology friend said, don't worry about it. I'll set you up for a, a stress test. So she did. She went on the stress test and she literally could not finish the stress test. She was so short of breath. But they read the stress test and they said, your heart is fine, you can get on the airplane. So she did, she got on the airplane and she flew to Colorado. She gave her, her, her keynote address. And when she was speaking, she had to fiddle with the microphone every sentence because she was so short of breath. She went back to her hotel room for five days and didn't go to the rest of the conference. She then got an airplane, flew back home. And when she was at home, she's watching TV and she watches this show called House and she sees there's somebody on house that has a PE, and she realizes that she has a PE. So she does not go to the, uh, the emergency room that night. She waits till the next morning. She goes to the emergency room, and actually, the emergency room doctor had seen one of, um, actually, Kenny Rosenfield give a PERT talk, so he actually called the PERT team at Mass General. We had a PERT call with her on the phone. She actually came down, and she got catheter-directed lysis. And so the reason I tell you that case is because this woman was, she was telling all of her friends, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, and they all said, oh, you're out of shape, you're stressed, you had an exercise tolerance test, you were fine. So it's really, really important to educate people about the signs and symptoms of clots, because I think people just don't know. And so uh, you, know, you should really uh, encourage people this month, which is VTE Awareness Month. So my take home points is that these DOACs have similar efficacy or mortality profiles as warfarin. Many have better bleeding profiles and they are considered first line therapy in many patient populations. There are no head to head trials with these DOACs. So which one to use really depends on patient factors and preferences. So is this someone that's gonna take a once a day drug or a twice a day drug? Is this someone that's gonna be able to give them shots for the first week or not? Is this someone that's gonna be able to take it with food? and then looking at their insurance. 
It's very important for clinicians to understand when and how to use these drugs and their limitations, which I went through with you. And the novel agents, I think, are definitely an attractive alternative for cancer patients. Are you kidding? Would you rather give yourself a shot, or do you want to take an oral pill? And their efficacy and safety are currently being looked at in many, many trials, and I think we will have our answer soon about that. Screening for occult malignancy in patients with an idiopathic VTE is not indicated, but it's very important to make sure patients are up to date with age-specific cancer-related screening, and then to follow up any abnormal labs on and history or physical findings. And then definitely increase your awareness in, ho in your hospitals about VTE. And then lastly, this is a slide I got from Michael Jaff. So I really think the new way to treat, the DOACs are great, but I think Tesla has even something more to offer. I think this is the wave of the future. So this was the Tesla car drive, drives owner to hospital after he suffers a pulmonary embolism. <laughs> so thank you very much.